Welcome to the first segment of a television series made by the people of the National Park Service. We believe that a good story should be told. We also believe that we need to create a spirit of national stewardship. We'd like to do this in several ways. First, we'd like to promote an understanding of the National Park Service. We'd like to highlight the wonderful stories about the National Park Service. They're diverse, they're complex, they're imaginative. To do this, we decided that television would be a good medium, the medium which we could connect the American people to their parks. And we thought there might be one theme that would do the connection very well. That one theme, your personal freedom. So it is our great wish that you will be connected to this series, but more importantly, that you'll be connected to our national parks and that you'll take away from this series the feeling, the spirit of our national parks in your mind, in your heart, and in your imagination. Some of you are a little surprised that I, with so many inducements as I have to remain at home, should have resolved to quit my family and my farm for the fatigues and dangers of war. I mean, you should be perfectly satisfied as to my motives. I am an American, and I'm determined to be free. Any time while I was a slave, if one minute's freedom had been offered to me, and I had been told I must die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it just to stand on God's earth a free woman, Elizabeth Freeman. Don't think it was an easy thing to be born a Jew. Under Sir Nicholas, there had been a reign of terror. The faster we thought of ways to keep a crust of bread in our mouths, the Tsar and his court thought of ways to snatch it away. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in Independence National Historical Park. It was here where the new nation took its first unsteady steps. And unsteady they were, for these upstart colonies were taking on one of the most powerful countries in the entire world. And yet they didn't flinch, they didn't yield. They were confident in their new ideas on freedom. These early steps paved the way for the creation of a new nation, for revolutionary ideas to sprout, for people to create a new concept in government based on individual freedom. And yet these freedoms, so valiantly fought for, were not given to all. For the African, for the woman, they were not seated at freedom's table. Not yet. Still, for that possibility to be free, each person will respond in their own ways to that question, what would you do for freedom? So join me and my National Park Service colleagues as we explore the meaning of freedom and those actions and sacrifices necessary to earn it. Our journey of exploration starts here in Philadelphia at Independence National Historical Park. And from here, we'll travel to three very different and distinctive national parks, but each connected by that fragile word, freedom. First stop, we'll be up in Concord, Massachusetts at Minuteman National Historical Park. And we'll take a look at the militiamen and his family of 1775 and their view of freedom. Next, we'll stop at Boston African American National Historic Site and take a look at the free African community on Beacon Hill of the 1850s. And finally, we'll head out to Statue of Liberty Ellis Island National Monument and take a look at the newly arrived immigrants of the early 20th century.
Well, we're standing in a building, of course, which dates back to 1732. It's most famous to us because of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the Constitution in 1787. But I also like to stand here outside in Independence Square, knowing that this is the place where people have gathered ever since those famous events to respond to them. Into the 19th and 20th centuries, this is where Americans came, and especially where Philadelphians came, to express their own um, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Famous buildings can help us see history as a time capsule, and that is history at a single moment in time. Uh, but time capsules also can be opened, and if you open a time capsule, you can see connections. You can see stories that extend across time. You can perhaps find your own history within those multi-layered stories extending across time. It's true of ideas, even the very foundational ideas that emanate from a place as famous as Independence Hall. Those ideas, they come out. They are debated and honored and sometimes challenged from one generation to the next. What we meant in going for those red coats was this. We'd always governed ourselves and we always meant to and they didn't mean that we should. The men who responded to the Concord Alarm were a unique breed of man. These were not members of some warrior class, and yet they had fought in many battles to protect their homes and their family. They had been hardened by the clearing of a wilderness. Now here in the frontier, the ability to work with others toward a common good was basic to their survival. And out of this need, the development of democratic institutions that would dramatically change how people thought and how people acted. Town meetings would pretty much control all aspects of their inhabitants' lives, and yet they were run by free and open discussion. Concord was an old town in 1775. It had been settled in 1635. By 1775, they were in their fourth and fifth and even sixth generations of people living on the land. And they had turned this landscape into a traditional English farmstead. I think a lot of people from England could have come and said, you know, this, this looks like one English landscape, one we recognize. It was new, but it was New England. And they thought that they inherited and merited the rights of English people. Stability, continuity, reproduction, that's what they aimed at, not change, not the uh, movement towards things new that we've come to pride ourselves on is distinctively American. With the population pressures on the land, with the tensions in the family, with also growing inequality that was a product of too many people and not enough land. With all these social problems developing and with conflicts in town meeting, people may have felt that they were losing control, losing something of their traditional life. And what the British assault on the towns does is effectively to uh, be both a real threat to colonial liberties and at the same time um, a metaphor for all the ways in which they're losing control of their lives. What really um, produces the uproar and conquer is the invasion of the town itself, the um, attack on local autonomy. We are here on the Muster Field, as it's known in Concord, and uh, there were about 400 colonists here just before the bridge fight. At the time of the battle, this place was already 140 years old, and you had 140 years of farmers clearing the land. So the colonists here on this hill had a very clear view. We're looking right at the British redcoats down by the bridge. To British Parliament, this is a petty squabble over taxes. It's annoying, but it's not a big deal. To the people over here in the colonies, it struck a much deeper chord. To them, it wasn't so much about the taxes as it was a threat to their right to govern themselves. The British soldiers in the center of town captured some of the military stores and were burning them. There was smoke coming from the town. Joseph Hosmer said, will you let them burn the town down? This was really a feeling of this is the moment of truth. We're actually going to march against the king's army. As the colonial militia swept down the hillside behind me, 
actually quite in good order, I might add, upon the British regular troops here at North Bridge. The sacrifices they were about to make would be later captured in the pen of Thomas Jefferson as he wrote the last sentence in the American Declaration of Independence. He wrote, we mutually pledge to ourselves our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And for their lives, their fortunes, and their honor, not only these militiamen, but also the families and the communities they represented, would be laid bare as they answered the question of what would you do for freedom? Historic sites are often points of commemoration. And it is difficult sometimes to open ourselves away from commemoration to also consider multiple stories. The layers of history that exist in these places give us a stronger feeling and they tell a richer story. They allow us to see that freedom, for example, has many dimensions. In the 1850s, Philadelphia, along with other northern cities, were, were faced with the prospect of enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. If you were accused of being a fugitive slave in Philadelphia, uh, the place where you were brought to, to, be, to face a hearing, to establish your identity as a fugitive or not, was the second floor of this building that we know as a place of freedom. Uh, and so it becomes a place in that period where freedom still had to be fought for. And in 1835, in the anti-slavery record, we see the name the Liberty Bell in reference to this bell. So that's the first time the bell was known as the Liberty Bell. Freedom has always been on the mind of the enslaved African. For not only was it a struggle to gain one's freedom, it was also a struggle to keep one's freedom. What better place to explore the complexity of America's story than at the Boston African American National Historic Site? The ancestor spirits are here. Listen close, my brothers, my sisters. For this is the African Meeting House. This is the very place where our community would discuss the issues of the day and pray for a better tomorrow. If these walls could talk, oh, what stories of freedom they would tell. And yes, sir, it was right here in the very sanctuary where we founded the New England Freedom Association. As a community, we would provide assistance to each and every fugitive who made their way to freedom here in Boston. But not fugitives, no, they were freedom seekers. Men and women who endured great hardships to find freedom. I don't believe that most Americans today can fully comprehend the extreme negative power of that symbol of racial injustice, slavery, to the free African community here in the 1850s or to African Americans today in 2003. To quote historians Jim and Lois Horton, slavery for this community was their personal and intimate enemy. In 1790, when we have the first United States Census, the only state that enumerates no slaves, no slaves, is Massachusetts. It is out of the optimism that comes from this tiny black community finding themselves all free that they begin to look to establish institutions in this community. They look to education, they look to religious institutions, and they also look for a place to live. And by 1820, most of the black people in Boston have moved to what they call Beacon Hill. This is a three-story brick building built when most black people lived in one and two-story wooden houses. And the African Meeting House was also the only public space that black people had control over. So it became not only a religious center, not only the center for their education, but also the center for all of their public civic activities. We are not free yet until all Africans in the United States are free. That we know that we are an unusual community because we are free here in Massachusetts. That there is slavery in other northern states and of course over 95% of the black people in America live in the southern states and 
90% uh, of them are enslaved. And, so, we, and so, so for us to fully have our freedom, there has to be an end to slavery in the whole country. And so they would say first, freedom for us is freedom for all black people. And therefore, that would explain just the tremendous amount of energy that was expended in this community to be part of the anti-slavery movement. The struggle to desegregate Boston schools is critically important. In 1849, you have a case of Sarah Roberts, a young girl. Her parents wanted her to be in an integrated school. Charles Sumner uh, takes up the case, ably assisted by the African-American attorney Robert Morris. He argues the case in 1849, and he is defeated. But six years later, in 1855, the schools in Boston are integrated. But one thing we see uh, in Boston and throughout American history is that the struggle for freedom is not something that is accomplished like that and then it's all over. This struggle has to be fought and refought and re-engaged over and over and gains made can be lost. So we find that many of the arguments that Sumner made in 1849 are echoed in the arguments that attorneys made in the landmark United States Supreme Court decision in 1954, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. The story of this national park site, the Boston African American National Historic Site, the story of struggle, cooperation, and triumph. The ending of racial segregation in the public schools here in Boston was a direct result of the actions taken by this community. When Frederick Douglass cried, to arms, to arms, 137 members of this community responded by enlisting in the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Infantry Regiments during the Civil War leaving no doubt what this community would do for freedom. If we hadn't become soldiers, all might have gone back as it was before. Our freedom might have slipped through the two houses of Congress, and President Lincoln's four years might have passed by and nothing been done for us. But now, things can never go back, because we have showed our energy, our courage, and our natural manhood. Private Thomas Long, 1st South Carolina Volunteer Colored Regiment. Look, I do not want to raise my children in this country any longer. I don't want no wars. I don't want no famine. I don't want no poverty. I don't want... I want to go to the United States. You work over there. The children will work over there. And... Uh, at least, we'll eat. My mother had to try and keep track of us. She finally took us and tied us together so that we would stay together. And that's the way we came off the boat. I don't think it's possible for me here today, standing in front of Ellis Island in all its restored beauty, to fully comprehend the level of anxiety that must have erupted in the breast of every American-bound immigrant, crammed as they were in the decks of the steamers, as they traveled here to America. That powerful mix of expectation and anxiety, especially when you see the Statue of Liberty on one hand and the imposing facade of Ellis Island, the Federal Immigration Station on the other, certainly must have caused the heart to skip a beat or two. the pictures the you know tell me so many wonderful stories about the immigration process they're very rich images and they're powerful scenes and they show all these crowds of people in their costumes and traditional clothing as they they stand on the decks of ships and they you know wave sometimes to the Statue of Liberty and then they're brought over to Ellis Island and of course it's interesting because even though there's an excitement there there's also a feeling of uncertainty in their eyes they look there's a fear there because they're not certain how the immigration service is going to react to their application to enter the United States. And you see the immigration service inspectors and you see the doctors and the matrons and the various employees getting the crowds together of the immigrants and keeping them in order and then beginning to interrogate them, ask them questions, uh, the medical testing. And you know, it's fascinating to see them go through this and you see the the, uh, the uncertainty in the beginning, and then once they passed and got through the immigration control, 
You see the relief and the happiness in their eyes and cheerfulness. For the immigrant, freedom would mean many things. And certainly freedom from slavery would be an important one. But of equal importance was freedom from religious persecution. And also high on the list, freedom from poverty. A land of opportunity beckoned. 10,000 different stories, each very personal, each reflecting sacrifice, would weave its way through the lines here at Ellis Island on a daily basis. And yet, enduring all that had been endured and still face the possibility of being rejected was hard to face. And yet, the human spirit is amazingly creative in its attempts to be free. This is an absolutely special place here at Ellis Island. This is the one that really hits home for me. Uh, it's the Board of Special Inquiry Room, and it was part of the immigrants' appeals process. So if things weren't uh, going well for the immigrant out in the Great Hall, they did have a final opportunity to try to have that decision overturned so that they could be allowed to enter the United States. Sir, face that direction and say hello as loud as you can. That's very good, but I had something more in mind like this. Stand over here for one second. Hello! Imagine 400 kids asking mommy at the same time. 300 gentlemen engaged in quiet conversation, and now you're stuck behind one of those desks trying to call somebody's name. In other words, you left this place every day with a sore throat. My father was in this line. They put a white chalk mark on his lapel. We didn't know what the meaning of it was. And as this line progressed, at one point they pulled him out of the line without any explanation. And my mother started to plead and cry. He didn't know. They were all talking in English. If there was some question about somebody's physical fitness, they would be marked with a chalk mark on their coat and pulled aside for further inspection. But in one instance at least, a young woman beat the system. She noticed that she had been marked on her coat with some chalk. She wasn't sure what it meant, but she noticed that people ahead of her in line who had these chalk marks, a few of them, were being pulled out of line. She turned her coat inside out, making the chalk mark invisible. And she got through, made her way into American society and was ultimately quite successful. I'm going to the United States to earn my living. Goodbye, my beloved country. I carry you in my heart. Don't condemn me for leaving my country. Poverty and necessity are at fault. At this auspicious period, the United States came into existence as a nation. And if their citizens should not be free and happy, the fault will be entirely their own. President George Washington. Posterity, you will never know how much it has cost my generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. John Adams. I think these sites serve as focal points, as magnets for the gathering of citizens. And, and I think it's the activism of citizens, both that has preserved them over time and which keeps the, their meanings alive. Challenge when we come to historic places like this is to recognize the, the fluid aspects of freedom, that it's not an idea simply encapsulated in 1776 or 1787, that indeed it has been an idea that has been debated, that has been challenged, that remains vital in our society because people talk about it, because people fight about it sometimes. And if we can open up our historic places to those ideas, bring them in, talk about them, to, to challenge what might seem to be received ideas, then I think um, these historic places fully serve their purpose. And we've attempted to give you just a taste of the many stories that emanate from just four of our over 387 national park sites. The themes that link our national parks and their stories are as endless as one's imagination. And for those of us in the National Park Service, we're your stewards for these special places, America's treasures, her national parks, and her stories. And many of these stories are inspiring, but not all of them are. 
Many of these stories are uplifting and invigorating, but not all of them are. Folks, far too often we try to simplify our nation's story. We try to fit it into neat little boxes. It won't fit. Colonization, westward expansion, it doesn't work. Our story is far too complex. For we as a people are a complex people. To understand that complexity, you don't have to travel any further than North Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts, or the African Meeting House in Boston, or the Great Hall at Ellis Island. With over 387 national park sites, national heritage quarters, scenic and wild trails and rivers, there are plenty of places for us to tell America's complex story. And my ranger colleagues in the National Park Service, we look forward to telling you America's story in America's national parks. So until next time, visit a national park. Experience your America. sisters all across this holy land I will raise my voice and I will sing for the valleys I will raise my voice and make a stand I will sing for the ladies and all of the babies all across this whole 